Let's get started. Hello and welcome to the PRIF Mining Consortium's 2022 Annual Assembly. Let me start by acknowledging the Ghana people, the original custodians of the Adelaide Plains and the land in which the Adelaide Convention Centre and the University of Adelaide's campuses at North Terrace, Waite and Roseworthy are built. I will be your MC for the day and my name is Ruth Shaw. I am the manager of the ARC Training Centre for Integrated Operations for Complex Resources and the an outcome and achievement of the PRIF Mining Consortium. Today, we're here to celebrate the PRIF Mining Consortium's achievements. PRIF has been a five and a half year initiative with 17 industry partners and two universities. There've been 15 researchers in mining, mineral processing and computer science, 10 research students and eight postdoctoral researchers. They've been working on 14 research projects and 11 translation projects. PRIF has awarded 17 Women in Mining Technology Scholarships and has produced 135 publications and nine PhD graduates. Also exciting innovative technologies in software, sensing and processing. As a celebration of achievements, I'll be highlighting people's individual achievements during my introductions both in their personal lives and in their PRIF lives. So I would initially like to celebrate Tatiana Kamelova. Tatiana is the PRIF Consortium Manager. She has a PhD in Applied Engineering, a Master's Degree in Chemical Engineering and over 10 years of research experience in Mineral Processing and Material Science. In 2021, Tatiana completed the Professional Leaders Program at the University of Adelaide Tatiana is proud of the consortium achievements and looks forward to the successful completion of PRIF in February 2023 and the preservation of the PRIF achievements through the PRIF Legacy Group. If you have any general PRIF questions, please speak to Tatiana. Tatiana, you raise your hand and introduce yourself. Now on to the business of today with regards to housekeeping. In case of emergency, there will be a beep, 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 and we should prepare to evacu evacuate. Secure your materials and await instructions. The second tone will be a whoop, 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 and then that's when we need to evacuate. Obviously, don't use the lifts. Follow the Adelaide Convention Centre staff to the assembly point, which is adjacent to the riverbank near the boat shed. The toilets are out the door and to the right. Uh, morning tea, lunch and afternoon tea will be in the foyer. During today's program, after each presentation, there'll be time for one or two questions from the room. Kirsten and Yerniaz will be operating the roving microphone, so please wait for them before asking your question so that the online audience can hear your question. If our online audience has any questions, please enter them in the Zoom chat, and at the end of each consortium program, programs A and B, there will be time for discussions and questions, and that's when we'll go to our, on, to our online audience questions. So first off for today, we welcome Professor Nigel Cook. Nigel is the director of the PRIF Mining Consortium. Nigel has a background in mineralogy, geochemistry, and the char characterization and origin of mineral deposits, including extensive work over the past decade at Olympic Dam, looking at mineral species at the micron scale, and most recently, tracking the distribution of elements of interest through processing, smelting, and the refinery circuits. On a personal note, not only does Nigel know a lot about rocks, but outside of PRIF, Nigel has managed to lay turf in his front garden and has so far kept it weed-free. <laughs> oh, shaky on that one. So Nigel will give us an overview of the PRIF consortium so far, and tell us what happens and what we hope will happen next. Including the work of the PRIF Consortium Legacy Group, which the consortium has established to ensure the PRIF achievements can be built on in the future, and to see that PRIF's innovations and inventions are taken up by industry. Welcome, Nigel. Well, thank you, Ruth. And uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome everybody here to today's annual assembly. It's a real pleasure to see so many attendees, both in the room and online, many of which we know, but also quite a few that we don't. Thank you in particular to the consortium's industry partners for giving up your valuable time to come along today. 
We have a packed program, largely to be given by our research students, some of which who have already completed their research and moved on to new positions in industry or academia, yet are so keen to come back and join today's festivities. We also thank our energetic early career researchers who have put life and soul into the consortium. We're also very happy that the program includes guest presentations from Adrian Beer, CEO of Metz Ignited this morning, and then we have Caroline McMillan, the Chief Scientist of South Australia this afternoon. So I'm going to use a few minutes to tell you about the PRIV Consortium, its constituent projects, its structure and its overarching objectives. Apologies to the many friends and supporters of the consortium, who have probably seen this several times before, but we believe it's valuable to review who we are and what we are about, not least because of the many other major projects, past, present and future, being undertaken by Adelaide researchers in collaboration with the minerals industry. The PRIV Consortium was launched in October 2017 and runs until the end of February next year. It's a five-year initiative of the SA Government and started with a total cash and in-kind funding from the Government, industry and end-users, BHP and Oz Minerals, and our translation partners of around about $14 million. There's a total of 17 industry partners and two university partners, the University of Adelaide and the University of South Australia. The consortium is made up of 14 research projects and 11 translation projects. We've got 15 experienced researchers from across mining engineering, mineral processing, chemistry, computer science, a very transdisciplinary, 10 research students and eight postdoctoral researchers. The consortium and its constituent projects are split into two parts. We have program A and program B. Program A is the upstream component and addresses challenges in the optimization of upstream processes, while program B focuses on mineral processing from comminution through to leaching. These projects are aligned with the specific areas of interest of our end user partners, Oz Minerals in Program A and BHP Olympic Dam in Program B. The consortium projects have inputs and outcomes that link together to deliver the overall aim of maximizing value from complex resources. Our objectives are to address end user challenges, to maximize value from complex resources and minimize environmental impacts across the entire value chain. <laughs> Our outputs are sensors, be they acoustic, chemical, or whatever, monitors, new designs for equipment, machine learning models, algorithms, and software. Collectively, these outputs are shown to result in more stable performance, greater profits, and leaner operations that use less resources and help achieve their ESG targets. We aim to demonstrate the value of and provide innovative tools for integration between the resource, mining, or delivery, processing, and leaching stages, and in collaboration with our translation partners, we aim to develop technology solutions that represent global market opportunities. We aim, for example, to increase certainty on mill feed to deliver predictable performance, which will reduce the energy consumption in processing, grinding and concentration in the Australian mining industry, increasing efficiency, maximizing profit, and leaving a lesser environmental footprint. Today, you're going to hear the latest results from our researchers, now, many of our consortium projects have made significant progress over the last year. I don't want to include too many spoilers here, but would like to sort of single out the latest results of Difan Tang, who has developed a cost-effective real-time method for online hydrocyclone overflow particle size passing fraction sensing. That's hard to say that one. By force and acceleration measurements. And although still at the testing stage, this could potentially revolutionize the accurate assessment of the quality of mill discharge and flotation feed something which is really critical for mineral processing. I'd also mention how mine planning software based on an AI-driven approach to optimal scheduling under uncertainty has been developed by Anita Neumann and has been adopted by our translation partner MapTech within their Evolution software. My third example is the ongoing research at University of South Australia on a novel metal organic framework based fiber optic sensor for real-time online ferric ferrous iron concentration monitoring allowing improved uranium extraction. This technology is specifically focused on the tails acid leach system at BHP Olympic Dam and aims to mitigate the pulp gelation that reduces uranium extraction efficacy. And you'll hear more, more about those and other projects today. The consortium prides itself on not being a loose connection of individuals, but a real team that work together across disciplines. 
Indeed, and thanks to our regular meetings and workshops, we've become a real family, in turn catalyzing discussion, peer mentoring, and additional opportunities. We are also committed to equity and diversity and are delighted that 17 Women in Mining Technology Scholarships have been awarded by the PRIV Consortium from 2019 to 2022. We've also involved a number of students at Masters, Honours and Bachelor levels at both universities who, who have been or are working on projects relevant to the Consortium objectives. Our latest Honours recruits are with us today. Now, academics cherish publications and until now, Consortium researchers have written no less than 135 publications, including 86 papers published, 10 accepted, 12 submitted, and another 27 currently in preparation. And those numbers are flexible. Uh, this is only going to increase as our students complete their projects and publish their results in the next year or two. Now, I'd like to single out Anita's 22 publications, including seven conference papers relative to the PRIF. Linda, having been awarded the prestigious Hunter Healy Medal, at the Australian Colloid and Surface Science Student Conference and the 33, yes, 33 publication outputs from Richmond's group, including several in flagship journals such as Minerals Engineering. Despite COVID curtailing so many of our plans to participate in major international conferences, over the last couple of years we have been and continue to be out and about with presentations at Communution 21, GECO, the SME Annual Conference and Expo, and a strong presence at the upcoming IMPC Asia-Pacific Conference in Melbourne next month. Proof researchers also presented their results at the workshop Pathways to Commercialization and Implementation, which we established as a partner event as to the Copper, Copper to the World on the 17th of May earlier this year. So each of these events aim at showcasing PRIF outcomes and marketing new technologies. So we are here today to see the latest results from the consortium researchers and to celebrate our achievements. As this is the last annual assembly, but we're also here to talk about the potential benefits of our research and to consider how all the innovations, inventions and solid science that the PRIF has generated can be turned into value for our end users and translation partners in terms of implementation by the end users and potentially through commercialization. This is a theme you're going to see permeating throughout today's presentations. We're going to discuss that in the panel discussion this afternoon. There are many outcomes from the PRIF consortium that are destined to save money, others that can potentially make money if developed and commercialized, and still others which, if allowed to develop and mature, can help shape a sustainable, competitive minerals industry in the future. And you'll see examples of those today. So maintaining this drive into the future after the official end of the PRIF consortium next February is, we know, going to be a challenge. And for that reason, we've established a legacy group involving industry partners and other experienced advisors to help make us make recommendations and oversee the translation of PRIF research outcomes so that all the hard work is implemented and finds a home, whether within an existing project like the ARC Training Centre or a new project like the Copper for Tomorrow CRC that's being developed at the moment. And we also aim to secure the industry champions necessary who are committed and willing to take these concepts further. I sincerely hope that you find today's presentations interesting, but also that you enjoy the day and can celebrate with our researchers. I personally look forward to talking many, to many of you uh, during the course of the day. Thank you. It seems to have a life of its own now. Good. Make the day exciting. Welcome to those who don't mind. <laughs> As our first guest speaker of the day, we welcome Adrian Beer, the CEO of METS Ignited, an industry-led growth centre for mining equipment, technology and services, and services sector funded by the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources. <clears throat> the goal of METS Ignited is to drive the local commercialisation of innovation, enhance industry skills and capabilities, and grow export markets in areas where Australia has a proven competitive advantage. Most recently, Adrian held global leadership roles with two of the world's leading industrial technology companies, ABB and General Electric. Adrian's technical background is in electrical engineering for mineral processing, 
and his industry experience spans a broad range of sectors, including energy resources and critical minerals, transportation, util utilities and defence. His operational experience includes the engineering design and supply of industrial technology solutions, software product development, leading business transformation projects and turnarounds across capital intensive industries. Adrian holds several board and advisory board positions, including non-executive director of Robotics Australia Group, an advisory board member for Newcastle Institute for Energy and Resources, SmartSat CRC, and is a member of the Global Mining Guidelines Group leadership team. Adrian is also a member of the PRIF Mining Consortium Legacy Group. Welcome, Adrian. That all sounds very intimidating, even I'm nervous by that. Thanks for having me here. Um, as I spoke to a few of you outside, I'm a little bit inch deep, mile wide. I've been fortunate to spend a lot of time skipping across many different aspects of mining and engineering and starting off with grinding mill drive systems in the 90s and moving through a whole range of experience, flotation chemistry. We talked about uh, Cloncurry and Heap Leach Mines, which is uh, a conversation over the break. But um, I want to talk today about realising the full potential of what's been delivered from the research out of this program. Um, one of the reasons why these growth centres were formed by the federal government is to really leverage areas of domain expertise that we have in this country to help uh, grow jobs, increase revenues of companies, we want to increase exports, really contribute back to the economy. And one of the ways that we believe this needs to happen is we need to see research commercialised. We need to see it commercially available. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the sort of confusion or the disparity between what commercialisation is and what it means globally and then what it means locally and the opportunities we have. So a little bit about uh, what Mets Ignited has done. Um, as an industry growth centre, uh, we've been around for about six years. Uh, probably the biggest and easiest achievement to define is the collaborative projects that we have funded. And a number of the um, PRIF members are also participants in our collaborative projects. So with $15 million of investment into 30 projects, that have 66 industry partners. There's 20 new innovations now commercially available to the market. They've created now, it's almost a thousand jobs. And so uh, over 700 million of revenue generated from those products and services. And interestingly, a large number of those projects are now being used by multiple industry sectors because the translation of research into a commercial product or service makes it accessible for other industries to, uh, to purchase and access. So if you look at the um, investment return, every $1 million we put in, 50 million has been returned to the local economy. Now, this isn't all about the money, but the money is a metric that shows reach. And what we're trying to emphasize here is you make innovation commercially available, you make it accessible for a wider market, it expands the reach. And that's partly what I wanna talk about today. Um, a little bit about where the resources sector is globally. I'm sure this is no surprise to anyone in the room. Um, it's been, I don't like to say that resources is starting a transformation. I think the resources sector has been on an energy transformation for, for probably a couple of decades. The biggest challenge when you make a financial investment decision to build a mine is access to power, access to water, access to labour and access to the market. And so with a lot of remote operations that are off grid, high efficiency of a difficult energy source has been you know, typical for our industry. We've been solving that problem for 30 years. So really now what we need to do is see the technologies that we've used to solve that capital intensity in remote uh, operations or remote locations expanded to other industry sectors. Um, but there's challenges. And I think today the resources company's biggest challenges are really four things. First one is visibility. The resources companies know that there are a lot of innovations to overcome the challenges that they are facing, but they find them incredibly difficult to find. One way they overcome that is they fund research to address their specific challenges because they can't get access to the innovation available. So while that's fantastic for a program like this because we get our mining industry partners investing in research, 
if we can now get your research into the market, there's a whole range of other mining companies that will benefit from it. So we need to work on our visibility. Um, capability. Um, the operations of mining companies do not have the skills and capability or spare resources in their business to be across every single domain expertise and understand all the art of what is possible. And so they need help. So getting access to capability is really important for our mining companies. And they can't be expected to fund the development of the capability of the entire industry. Part of that comes from commercial returns, which is what I'm going to talk about a little later. Um, competency. Let's just say skill shortage. We all know the challenges about getting people, but it's not just about having people to do certain jobs. It's actually having access to expertise in the market to address particular problems at a given point in time. So if a mining company invests in a research program, develops a solution and implements it into their supply chain, well, that operating environment's there for 20 years. So that solution needs to be maintained for 20 years. So the same people in the workforce today aren't going to be there in 20 years' time. So how do you maintain, develop and retain those skills that you need for the technology that's in your supply chain? It's a really big challenge for mining companies and it's more significant than just trying to find people to hire. Um, capital. So capital is interesting, and this is talking specifically around investment because it manifests in many different ways. The first one is a perception that the industry is dirty and damaging to the environment, when in fact the majority of what we do is addressing the challenges of a clean energy future and reducing emissions. But therefore the flow of capital into our sector is a difficult thing for mining companies. When you're a technology company and you are trying to commercialise an innovation, it's difficult to size the total market for the new innovation, the new product or the new service. So if an investor is looking at your research outcome that might be with a translation partner as a product, they can't see the total available market for what you've developed. So they find it really difficult to invest. And there's a lot of other people also chasing their dollar. So I think the, the flow of capital into our sector needs to be not only do we make savings in efficiency, uh, in performance or in safety and sustainability within the operations that is going to benefit the mining companies, there is nothing wrong with selling that as a solution to generate income to support more research and more development and more enhancement of that product. We shouldn't be afraid to profit from the efforts of the research because that's how we build a sustainable research environment and allow us to continue the funding that we're going to need to keep running programs like this. So, oh, that's the summary slide if the animation doesn't work. I'll skip past. Um, <laughs> there's a great opportunity. So vendors in the market are looking for, first of all, technology to sell to the market. They're looking for a sustainable marketplace. I, I really like this program for the fact that you've got translation partners embedded in it. And it's an exception and it should be the norm. And I've just spent three days in Canberra talking about this program and how, come we need, how we need to fund more of these programs. Our mining industry has invested for nearly five decades in the Australian research sector. In the ARC programs alone, $4.2 billion has been invested just in research in the resources sector. What we haven't been doing is we haven't been investing in the translation partners, helping them scale and grow the commercialisation of the research outcomes. And that's why we often see our translation partners being bought by global companies. Now you heard in the intro that I'm ex-ABB and GE, so I am part of the problem, or I was. I'm here now hopefully to be part of the solution. Every time we begrown a piece of innovation from Australia being bought by a global company and taken offshore, we should actually look at the example that company is setting for the rest of the Australian uh, economy. If GE come all the way down under to find innovation and scale it globally, then why don't we do it locally? We have global representation from every major industrial organisation around the world, and we're the only country in the world that has that. We have all the major Asian, South and North Asian technology companies, all the European technology giants, all the US technology giants are all here in Australia. A number of them with many thousands of employees. So that's a significant capital investment for very large companies with global reach. So they come down under. So we must have a big enough market to, if we're going to attract them. We need to help Australian companies realise that there is a potential to go global 
just like global companies come to be local here in Australia. Um, so the economic opportunity, there's also, a, I guess, a commercial return on, a, on investment attracts more people to our market. If people see that there is an economic value add to what we do, they get interested, they get curious. And there's a lot of investors who look around saying there's a dollar in this. I, I was telling the story outside of, of one of my previous jobs. We were, we were at Klong as an ex-Macquarie Bank commodity trader. And he realised that you produce copper sulphate using copper oxide ore caps and went round the Mount Isa region buying all the oxide ore caps from all the copper sulphate mines and basically um, uh, sulphide ore deposits, sorry, and just irrigated them with sulfuric acid to provide copper sulphate to all those local mines. We made a lot of money doing that. Because he made a lot of money doing that, a lot of his peers said, oh, what is there in this sector? And started to identify all the other opportunities around us. But then they said, oh, there's some technical gaps. So we started funding research to understand how do we overcome those challenges. We actually hired Frank Trask from Kalgoorlie School of Mines who ran our liquid chem facility in Kalgoorlie because we needed researchers to overcome the technical challenges. But we also need the commercial partner to take that technical solution and deliver it to market. So what do we do now? As I said, the thing that we need to do and the reason why I'm part of the PRIF legacy group is we need to find commercial pathways for these research outcomes. There is some amazing innovation that has been developed out of this program and the work that's being done in the training centre as well. And we see all of these great innovations. My fear is that they don't reach their full potential. It would be a real shame for all of the work that has been invested over the course of this program was to stay in papers and stay in your heads and stay in the supply chains of the partners that helped fund it, but it doesn't reach its full potential. So what the most important thing about this group is, is the translation partners. We have to be grateful for our mining companies that have sponsored the program. We have to be grateful to BHP, we have to be grateful to Oz. We have to realise that they've been investing for decades in our research sector. But now it's time to shift focus. Now we need to go to our translation partners. We need to help them make it a success. And I'm sure you'll find in the translation partners in the room, if it's not them, they will know someone who will. And so now it is time to get the research outcomes into a commercially sustainable delivery model so that the rest of the market can benefit from the outcomes of the research that you've done. So my favourite thing about this slide is not that it was in supported by the top. I think that we should all be very proud of the fact that Australia's mining companies invest so much in research. But the best thing about this slide is the line across the bottom. The issue is there's not enough logos on the bottom and we need to bring more into the group. We, there is so many, uh, actually I'm going to talk in a minute about Olympic Dam and I, I just um, spoke briefly with Professor Dowd. When I spoke to the ARC group, we talk a lot about Olympic Dam because obviously it's close to everyone's heart, it's nice and local, it's a great operation and it's a very complex operation. But we also, when we look at improving the production in, in the, I mean, part B of this particular group, one of the things we need to consider is how does the technology get into a mining operation in the first place? Who makes the decision to put it in there? How do they buy it? When do they buy it? Why do they buy it? And then what are the opportunities to implement, update, maintain that technology? So I might jump through a little bit about, I think most of you would have seen slides similar to this about the life cycle of a mining operation, how long it sits there as an exploration. Uh, depending on the commodity cycle or the mix of commodities in the ore body depends on how much investment over time is made into the exploration, which is really just having a better understanding of what's in the ground before we start mining it. Hopefully we get to a point where the economics stack up, we make the big financial investment decision to build it. It takes twice as long, it costs twice as much. It takes another year and a half to hand it over to operations than we expected. So five years after it was meant to be running, it's up and running. And then the asset gets tweaked and optimised with the status quo for the next 10, 15 or 20 years, depending on how big the ore body is and how stable the ore body is. Some of them will change over time as we get different types of ore as we move through the ore body. But generally speaking, we are optimising a 20-year-old plant the majority of the time. Now, if we take 
Olympic Dam, it was a, it was a, it's a big multi-stage complex project, right? It really was 1975 when it was discovered. And then if you look at the timeline, it was like 1986 before we went, yeah, you know what, let's, let's put this into production. And then from an operational point of view, 88 was really when, when the site got up to full production, was up and running. Well, not full production, at the time, target production. So, I mean, that financial investment decision process that went from 1975 to 1985, 10 years, that went through multiple bankable feasibility, pre-feasibility, front-end engineering and design, throw out that one, design a new one, and it was based at the technology of the day. So the first thing to think about is the initial building of um, Olympic Dam is based on 1975 technology. And it's technology trusted in 1975 because we all know the mining industry is not going to take risks on new innovation on a couple of hundred million back then, a couple of billion dollars today, capital investment decision that's got to pay back to shareholders in three to five years. And then we had phase two. So after it was in operation, lots of opportunities to expand and grow the site. And it's had a very long life. It's had multiple attempts to be expanded, some successful, some not. Well, I think we've all been part of different BHP expansion projects, uh, Olympic Dam expansion projects. But if you just take a look at the site today and the bottom paragraph there, it's and you think about how the operation is organised, and I've probably got it wrong because it depends on how you filter it, but so metallurgical complex, grinding and concentrator circuit, hydrometallurgical plant, solvent extraction for copper and uranium, a copper smelter, a copper refinery, an electro refinery, electro winning refinery, a recovery circuit for precious metals. And that's just a rough version of what's actually there. So there's a few things I want you to think about when I talk about all those areas. First of all, there's a manager for each of those areas or a person responsible for the production in that area. That person doesn't make buying decisions for technology. That person is responsible for the throughput in that particular part of the plant. If you have done research that's going to help them do a better job or achieve their targets, they want to know about it. But while they want to know about it technically, procurement want to know that commercially, if they procure that technology, it's not going to disrupt anything else in the operation. And if they're going to rely on it to achieve their delivery objectives, they also want to know who they ring when it stops working. Or can you support it? Or can we implement it in our three other sites because we want to standardise on this? If you're BHP, you have over 100,000 vendors in your procurement system. That's a hard thing to manage. And so when you choose to add someone to your procurement system, you're trusting them with your asset. So now you put the BHP lens on, they are large assets, long life, huge dollars. They're only going to buy from people they trust who can support their operations. It's not because they don't value the technology, it's just a big complex business. So as we get to the end of the research and as we recognise the value we've created for all the different programs that we've delivered, now we've got to think about who benefits from it. And if there's a beneficiary, how would they get it? How do they buy it? How do they convince procurement that this is the right thing to do? Has your research been packaged up in a way that another customer can put it in their operation? And if not, the best thing about this program is you've got people in the room who can answer that question and they're your translation partners. Because every day of the year, they are out there talking to mining customers about selling the value of their products and services. They are the ones running the procurement gauntlet to help out the operational people on site deliver the KPIs that they need to achieve. So that's where I say now is the time to start shifting our focus. Now is the time to think about the commercial pathways for the research outcomes. Don't let them be stranded as a, public, uh, as a published paper and not realise their full potential. I can assure you there are hundreds of mines around the world with complex mineral processing plants that would benefit in some way, shape or form from the research you have done. So let's find a way to get it available to those people. Let's make sure that it reaches its full potential. How? There's the answer. Um, it's not easy, but 
what we've learned at Metz United is there is a huge amount of what we call stranded technologies. The research that you've developed at the moment, we call it stranded. Because you're at TRL 5 or 6, some at 4, some of it might need further technical advancement, some of it might need to pause and evaluate the commercial delivery model to determine whether or not we should advance the technology. Some of it may be finding the right partner who's already further down the same stream that you're already working on with a different solution for which yours might be complementary. So now is the time to pause, to, to take stock. And as Nigel and I have been doing, looking at the TRL readiness, I'm now looking at the commercial maturity. Who's the partner that's got the right commercial delivery model to take that research, turn it into a product and deliver it to market? That's where I want to see us focus because the easy sell for me to the Australian government is the bottom line. If we can increase our technology exports out of the investment the mining companies have made in our research sector by just 10 per cent, it's 36 billion contribution to the economy. So 10 per cent in relative terms is actually quite a small number. And if you read stories about Australia on economic complexity index and where we sit and we're declining, that's because we're not doing this translation piece. Unfortunately, our research is so good, it's got too far ahead of our commercial engine. The commercial engine in Australia is lagging behind our research capability. So our focus at Metz Ignited is to try to get the commercialisation engine to catch up. When we come and ask, don't be afraid of us. We're here to help. We want to make sure your research gets as far and as wide as possible and we want customers to benefit financially and we want the delivery partners to benefit financially because that's the return on investment that will continue to fund your research. It's really important that we get this right. I'll leave this as a parting comment. I have not kept track of time so someone is going to wave at me shortly but I think I've got about two minutes. My point is innovation is not a charity. And while our end market operators have been generous in their funding of research, we need a marketplace to translate research into a commercial product or service. So a marketplace is made up of a supply and a demand, a marketplace to transact within. So value can be shared by everyone. And so all I ask is that we do as much as we can to spread your research as far and as wide as we possibly can. And the more people who learn about it, the more people who get curious about it, and we start attracting the next generation of researchers to continue your work. Because if it's only this group and it only stays in the family, no one else is going to know we're here. So that's why I'm here. Uh, that's why I'm here today. I'm excited to listen to the presentations throughout the day. And if anyone's got any questions on this, more than happy to uh, catch me outside and uh, let me know how I can help. Thank you to the translation partners who are in the room because without you, this research doesn't make it to market. Thank you to Oz, thank you to BHP for investing in the research in the first place. Please acknowledge the fact that our mining companies in our local market have spent nearly five decades investing in research in Australia. So we are all here today because of them. Now let's use the translation engines to show the rest of the world what we've produced. I'll leave it at that. Thanks, everyone. Don't run away, Adrian. Don't run away. We actually have time for a few questions from the room. If anyone has any questions for Adrian, I forgot about that. I believe there's a roving <laughs> microphone. Kirsten, have you got the microphone? Where are you? Uh, Kathy had a question. Just more of a comment than anything. Thank you very much, Adrian. You summarized excellently where the companies stand versus research and all that. So that your your presentation should be videoed and started uh, presented to researchers at the beginning of all their projects, particularly not necessarily the fundamental ones, but the applied ones. You know, yeah, it's it's really really good. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. I, I agree with Cathy. Um, Gavin Yates, Chair of the, the PRIF Board. Um, what I found missing from your presentation was uh, the, there was an absence of comment on IP. 
Mm. And IP seems to be one of those obstacles that gets in the way of this translation. And I think, and it'd be worth you re-articulating, you, you did mention where the value lies in the mining company's application through the translation partners delivering. But from a researcher point of view, um, often they're seeing the value in their IP. So could you just comment on the whole IP argument? Yeah, IP is an interesting one. It's actually quite unique to Australia. Well, it's not unique to Australia, but it, Australia has a unique manifestation of the IP challenge. And I think it stemmed from strong competition from tier one miners in driving down the bottom of the cost curve in bulk commodities predominantly. So if you sort of think about innovation in the mining sector, it started with base metals, it shifted around to bulk. There's obviously the energy commodities as well. And now we're going to critical minerals, which is a whole different mix again. So when it was a volume based bulk mining market, um, getting to the bottom of the cost curve assured that your um, business would remain profitable for a long period of time in global competition. And therefore IP became really important. And and for background, my, I'm going to flavour this with, um, so John McGar, when he was head of uh, Rio Tinto t and I, I was the head of Rio Tinto corporate accounts at GE, and we used to hate each other. We're great mates now, but because he wanted all my IP and he wanted it for free, and I wanted to charge him hundreds of millions of dollars to buy it, and I wouldn't let him have the IP. And so because we went through that phase in Australia, I think we almost we overvalued IP or we put the wrong type of value on IP. We knew that IP was valuable because people were fighting for it. So therefore, if we had IP, I had to protect it. And we became really defensive and really protective around IP. We've seen a shift in the past three to five years in the Australian market that is cascading through the mining operations. It started at tier ones. They don't want any more of their own IP. They're not racing down the cost curve to the bottom anymore. Their shareholders have different concerns today that's about sustainable production. That's about diversity and inclusion. That's about their emissions. And they know that just like safety, they can't address those things by doing it all themselves. They also can't maintain the legacy IP that made them profitable 20 years ago. No one's around today to do it. I mean, you look at autonomy in, in Rio, right, in the iron ore. I mean, that's COBOL and Java software. You know, you, they only teach that in history now. They don't even teach that in, in engineering anymore. So. So they've learnt that while it gave them competitive advantage 15 years ago, diminishing returns today. Now go to the push of critical minerals, smaller ore bodies, faster mines, probably more modular, set up and collapse quickly, possibly collaborative processing centres for multiple different ore bodies owned by different companies. The whole dynamic changes and therefore IP becomes an obstacle for success and it needs to be made available. What we're trying to do when I say commercialisation, we're actually talking about commercialising IP. We're talking about bundling it into a product or service so the benefits of the IP can be purchased as a product or service and implemented. The individuals who develop the IP should be rewarded for it. That's why they should pay for it. And that's why some of the profits should go back into research. But really, when we talk about IP, IP now needs to be monetized. And the great news is the mining industry no longer wants to hold it. The problem is that our vendors don't know how to work with researchers to do that. And that's why this is such a good opportunity. So I don't know if that answered, but yeah. Thanks for such a great talk. I'm Michael Goodside. I direct the Institute for Sustainability, Energy and Resources, and I'm research director for Copper for Tomorrow, which is one of the hopefully positive legacy. Just a couple of um, anecdotes. I moved here from Denmark, where the IP um, rules for working with research institutions is a law. It's standardized. Yep. So it's easy. Everybody knows exactly what they get. Some would say it might be sub-optimized, but you don't spend time on it and you don't shop around to different universities to get a better IP position. Yep. Um, and, and so um, I would encourage whoever has a voice to try to get their um, something more standardized. 
and especially with with something um, where where there's a CRC or a PRIF or something like this, where you also have kind of a standardized model to get the outcomes that you suggest. And and I'm listening because, of course, we have to address IP in our CRC conversation. You'd be welcome to write that. Uh, mm. Yeah. <laughs> so because I, I agree in it. The the other comment I'd I'd like to make, and this is just my personal observation, having only been here a few years, is I've never met a more passionate and dedicated group of, pro of professional staff on the academic and administration side um, and their colleagues from industry working together with future talent and every single one of these projects traces to talent and it's my personal opinion and observation we have a real crisis globally in securing that talent and somehow as part of the 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 legacy group i would encourage a conversation as to how to secure that um, because without the talents of some of the people we've already heard from today and we're going to hear from, there won't be any research capability. And without pathways for some of these um, people that have just been through the PRIF um, the, to, to interact with universities, and, and there, there won't be that either. And, and um, you know, all kudos to the team that's been helping these students, but there's a real challenge in making sure they're secure in the future. Industry's rising to that challenge. And I think that um, together as a collective, we all need to find a sustainable model, um, not from the environmental side, but from the financial side, and ones that, that is ex as exciting to demonstrate to, to, to future students that mining's part of the solution Mm. Mining miners have been trying to become more sustainable for decades, not just from the time somebody saw a, an ad on TV, and and that um, for us to get to a modern energy system based on variable renewable energy or even hydrogen that requires iridium as part of its its electrolysis process, you need mining. Absolutely. And and so um, you know I I know I'm preaching to the choir, but we can't in my mind, forget that everything links, uh, links to talent. And today, I, I just wanted to, to say, as somebody who came in from the outside, how impressed I am with the team, um, academic and professional and industry members like you spending your time to develop that. Thanks. So I know we're running short of time, but I want to make two quick comments to that, right? So commercial maturity is a marketing story, essentially. The fact you had to come down here and find, like, find us hidden here is is it's great that we're here it's a shame you had to come all the way to find it for, you know it's not out there so we we talk about commercial maturity it's commercial maturity is not commercial readiness so everyone's familiar with trl everyone gets to trl 9 they think we're commercially ready that doesn't mean we're commercially mature there are a lot of really rubbish products in the market in every sector because very commercially mature companies sell them there are amazing products in the market that no one knows about because commercially immature companies own them. So part of this thing about attracting skills to our sector and seeing what we're capable of is actually a marketing problem. And we are the ones with the marketing problem. We don't celebrate our successes loud enough. We only celebrate amongst ourselves. Go back to the Denmark comment and IP, and I was part of the Swedish mining clusters at ABB. And it's a great example. So, and it, it, Gavin, it goes a little bit back to your question. IP is almost more commoditized. It's just treated, it's, it's not truly commoditized, but it's treated as a more generally available thing, not as protected as and defended as much as it is here in Australia. But in the Swedish mining clusters, the governments would not invest in the mining companies or co-invest with mining companies to solve challenges for those mines. They would actually co-invest with the vendors in their market to develop products and services to meet the needs of the mines. So at LKAB that we're talking about in Belieden, they would talk about their problems, but their co-investment went with Atlas Copco, Sandvik, Epiroc, ABB. And if you now think of those companies, they all have 75 to 80% market share of underground mining equipment globally. Because let's face it, if you can make LKAB and Belieden an economic in the Arctic Circle, Magnetite, Hard Rock, two kilometers underground, then you can solve underground mining anywhere in the world. So I think channeling investment through translation partners to commercialize the outcome the mining company needs is the way that we really hit scale and that what we need to do different in Australia. I'm sure I've killed the time now. I'll get you on the coffee break for other questions. Thank Thanks, everyone.
Oh, good. Thank you very much. So as Adrian mentioned, he will be here all day. So please catch up with him during the breaks. I'm sure he'd love to have a chat. Also a reminder to our online audience, Linda is monitoring the online questions. And if you have any, we'll get to those during the discussions section of the agenda. So now we will go on to program A of the consortium and introduce Professor Peter Dow, the program A leader. Peter is also the director of the ARC Training Centre for Integrated Operations for Complex Resources. Peter has more than 40 years experience in academic research, teaching and administration, and in consulting to industry. His research interests include many areas from predictions in mineral resourcing to financial analysis and modelling. During the PRIF lifetime, Peter has become a grandfather. He was elected the president for the International Association for Mathematical Geosciences, and appointed a member of the Deep Time Digital, Digital Earth Governing Council, which is the International Union of Geological Science Big Science Program. Congratulations, Peter, and welcome to the stage. Thank you. I just press this to go for. Um, this is to give you uh, really a an overview of exactly where we are at this stage in the BRIF Consortium. As you know, we only have a few months left. Uh, I'm afraid it's going to be a summary in statistics and titles, but you're going to hear all of the beef behind that when our presenters uh, come on, on to up here later in the day. Okay. To put it into context, you've seen this before and you're going to see it many times during the day. Uh, program A concentrates in the areas that are covered by that oval shape there. And don't worry about the numbers and the titles, but the blues in there represent the individual projects. T meaning a translation project, and R meaning a research project undertaken by a PhD student or a postdoctoral researcher. Um, Bill Skinner provided this as a very good uh, image of exactly what we do and how we're structured. So we have downstream as the, sorry, the upstream is the uh, closely defined resource model and downstream is the recovery of the material from that. And what we've put on here is tools for a learning system. So on with the summary of where we are, the themes that we've used up until now and will continue to the end of the, the PRIF are optimization. This is for program A, of course. Optimization, resource modeling, heterogeneity, uh, quantifying uncertainty, blending strategies, and mill feed sourcing. And the research approaches that have been used are everything from real time updating of resource models, that is, making use of data that become available now, making that to update the, the, the resource model now, uh, blending strategies. Uh, mill feed sorting, quantitative uh, ge geometallurgy, optimised, can't read it from here, <laughs> blending, automated resource domain boundaries. And again, to put this in very simple statistics, of the projects that are in Program A, we have 66 pub published papers. Uh, there are several, as Nigel pointed out, that are nearing publication. And we have these mostly in very high level international journals. And we also have a number of PhD completions, which I'll come to in a following slide. So to summarize what we were doing here in the, uh, the, the PRIF for Program A, across the top, you have what we call translation projects, which are really what uh, Adrian was talking about before. Uh, and then the research projects undertaken by individual PhD students, or postdoctoral researchers. Most of the postdoctoral researchers are actually involved in the blue um, uh, squares across the top, and in the green ones on the bottom, they are largely PhD projects with one or two exceptions. All of these uh, projects have a title and a number associated with them. Don't worry about the number. The title is what, what's important. These are the translation projects. Uh, there are uh, seven of them here seven because the first one is divided into two uh, and I think one of the others actually had a subset as well and you have the researcher's name on the right followed by our estimated uh, completion 
So where we've completed, that means the project has actually been completed. Uh, there's nothing more to do in it, uh, either because it's stalled, as in the first, uh, in, no, not on that one, in the next slide, or it's awaiting publication of outputs. So you can see at this stage, it, it's a reasonably, reasonably uh, good progress, and we expect that by the end of February next year, uh, all of those projects will have been completed. And completion for me really means also that there is some tangible output, at, mainly that would be in a published output. The, the research projects, there are seven in program A, uh, again in the same structure here, don't worry about the numbers. Um, the, the first one on there uh, was withdrawn, this was a PhD student who uh, had uh, particular problems at home and eventually had to go out and earn a living for his family uh, and he he achieved quite a reasonable amount but eventually he was withdrawn and he had to, he went to work in industry apart from that one you can see that we have very high completion rates here and all of those projects will finish either before the end of february next year or by a month or two after that We've also established uh, a translation readiness chart that we look at on, on a regular basis. Um, when you look at this, for each one of these projects, again, the, the, the RPs represent research projects, and the following slide will be translation projects. You might say, well, those reds are pretty much to the left and not so far to the right, but I think we're being fairly rigorous here. You can read TRL levels, which are hopelessly optim optimistic. The, the critical point for us really is to have at least a level two or a level three, which would put it in a position where it could eventually, in the short term, be pushed over the line into the, blue, into the purple category. And that's really what we were talking about with the legacy group. There are even the ones that have, um, say, number four, uh, the reason that's a number a one on there is because of the particular problems that are associated with it. But it can also be that in these early areas, the fundamentally difficult problem is actually very early on. And suddenly, if that is solved, you get a very quick uh, progression after that. The others, maybe some of them, it's spread throughout the, the period uh, on the red chart there before it can get to any possibility of uh, moving any further. And you can see on the second column there, the ones that are uh, completed. Uh, and you can see most of those now are completed. For the translation projects, uh, the same type of map. And again, the second column there shows you those that are completed. Uh, you can see that we've got one, two, three, four completed, five with the first one. Uh, we've said that con was concluded rather than completed. It could not proceed because of difficulties within the mining operation that we were trying to address the particular problem. Uh, but it, it came out with a very good TRL level. Um, and again, on there, that's quite a route, what we would say for a, a university-based PhD project or uh, a postdoctoral research project that would be a reasonably good position to end up in for all of those projects. And again, the same question, what now happens to push them over at least into the purple category and commercially beyond that? So these are all of the uh, researchers that have been involved in those individual projects. Uh, some of them are here today. Uh, some of them have moved on to other positions elsewhere. And that is a very quick overview of Program A as it stands today. So we'll now go on to the first of our PhD projects for today. Yerniaz Abeldin is a PhD student from the School of Civil, Environmental and Mining Engineering at the University of Adelaide. His PhD project created new methods to keep the resource model reliable with more accurate information, significantly reducing the uncertainty of the resource estimation and aiding further mine planning, thereby cutting costs and driving profit. In 2021, Yerniaz was awarded the Best Presentation at the Annual Research Conference, School of Civil Environmental and Minding Engineering at the University of Adelaide. Yerniaz has taken up swimming in preparation for Ocean Man, a series of open water swimming races that are held all over the world. 
Concurrently, Yerniaz is planning to complete his PhD by December of this year and is seeking opportunities to apply his knowledge and skills in industry within a collaborative environment. So as Gavin and Mike and Adrian noted, capabilities and talent are required in the mining sector and Yerniaz is looking for a position. <laughs> Okay, thank you for the introduction. Um, so, hello everyone. My name is Yernia Savilin, and today I'm going to talk about constraints and quantifying uncertainty on research domain boundaries. So, my project is located under exploration and evaluation section in this uh, flowchart, and the ultimate aim of the project is to reduce uh, the quantified uncertainty on domain boundaries in order to reduce overall uncertainty in resource model, and also uh, to meet sealable product specification for the mill feed. So the general outline of today's presentation is like this. I will give some brief background information, what is domain and what is domaining, and the proposed methodology for that one, and so on. So before starting, I have some questions. So what if uh, you had geological map like here on left side, and after integrating machine learning techniques, uh, it can become like this. So for this answer, uh, for this question, I'm going to give answer in today's presentation. Um, mineral resource estimation in general consists of four major steps. First is uh, data collection and preparation. And second one is geological model or defining the, the domain of interest, which is directly related to my project. And Third one is the estimation of grades uh, within each domain. It, it can be geometrological, geological, or grade domains. And later on is determination of the uncertainty in the model. So now I would like to give some, uh, give some uh, brief analogy. So, so just imagine you have a jigsaw puzzle, uh, and the domain is the object that you're looking for, or the pet, like in these pictures. So you are looking for dog or cat, and uh, each puzzle, each piece of puzzle, gives you the information about pattern and the color. Based on that, you can come up with the strate strategy to assemble this puzzle. So the domain is the essentially dog or cat that you're looking for. And uh, in third stage of the mineral resource estimation, uh, you quantify which dog you like and what, in what extent it can bring the happiness to you. So in mining sense, uh, it's money that uh, it brings to the company. So the meaning is essentially like this. But it's not simplified like here. Uh, in one picture, you, you might have several puppies and the cats as well. And uh, it depends on the, your purpose, what you're looking for, what breed probably, and the kittens or puppies, and so on. So let's move to the proposed domain methodology or strategy to assemble uh, that puzzle. First of all, we have our geological information. Then, as a first part, we have geostatistical simulation of uh, quantitative grade variables. Then we uh, train our classifier in part two and apply that classifier to the results coming from the part one in, from simulation. Then by that, we can produce probabilistic domains such as um, uh, dolomite, hematite pressure, or volcanic, and so on. And uh, like a key ingredient or secret ingredient is here the pre-processing because the overall method is data-driven and the pre-processing plays an uh, essential role for the next answer or the previous, for the previous question. So simulation. Uh, in, general, in general, the subset of uh, MALU in Promet Hill was selected and the all essential um, procedures was, I mean, all es essential steps and cross-validation cross was done by established uh, procedure, procedure in geostatistics, and by that um, we were able to produce uh, 100 scenarios, or we call it realizations, so 100 realizations, and for the example, on right side of the slide, you can see the realization one for iron, so the, in general, maps look like this, and there are 100 of them for each variable that you can see on the table. So for the classification part, uh, we have our input essay data, which the, those uh, 20 elements. And for the output, we have one categorical variable, which consists, uh, which contain 
uh, 12 classes, so which you can see on the right side of the slide. And we train our classifier, and based on the different tests, the most promising one was the extreme gradient boosting method with accuracy around 80%, so which is pretty good with the data which has some inherent problems. So just to give some visual understanding, uh, here you can see the two maps. On the left side, you can see the reference model from Promen and Hill done, uh, created by the geologist. And on the right side is the most probable outcome from 100 realization after the classification. So let's move to the cross section of the uh, top view of that uh, 3D body. And you can see that in general, the, the main features uh, between the models are comparable and match to each other. But it's like it can't be compared directly since the left, left uh, geological map contains the five uh, main classes, but for our case, it, it is 12. So it's quite different. But you can see that general features are similar and uh, on right side is uh, totally like a data-driven method. And another aspect is that the key is the probability of the most probable outcome. By that, you can... Uh, do more uh, in your decision-making process and it can give you ideas and how to handle the uncertainty in general. So let's move to the main part, which is a uh, key ingredient, so pre-processing. After applying some noise filtering methods from the machine learning field um, for some problem problematic classes, for example, in our cases, hematite pressure and hematite quartz pressure, uh, essentially the problem is uh, for geologists during the core logging process, it's hard sometimes to uh, lock the hematite quartz breacher and it's most of the time mislocked as a hematite breacher, just a hematite breacher. That's why the number of samples is different. And in our case, hematite breacher is major class and hematite quartz breacher is minor class. And after applying pre-processing, noise filtering, uh, the number of samples in hematite breacher from uh, 2000, uh, uh, 27,000 uh, decreased to 23, while in hematite quartz pressure it increased around two times. So some of the, label, uh, the samples was relabeled, some of them was removed because of the noise. And uh, based on that, we can see that the decrease and increase for hematite pressure is neglectable, but for hematite quartz pressure, especially the, for the classifier, is really good help in general. So, and also it has corresponding probability maps, and you can see that it's changed a lot. And I did cross-validation with uh, expert, with geologists, relocked drill holes in some places, and it seems it's very, uh, I, it matched very well with the expert's cross-validation. So, for the future work, um, that work is done, and my research is uh, about these geometological domains. Since hematite, hematite quartz pressure is correlated with uh, steel hematite and the grinding time for the steel hematite and just uh, hematite is a bit uh, quite different. So it's good aid for the estimation grinding time. And another uh, step in my research is to updating process. Whenever we integrate new information in this process, how it impacts to the domain boundaries. So it's next step and yeah. So I would like to acknowledge my uh, supervisors, uh, Associate Professor Chao Shui Su and Professor Peter Daud and Dr. Amir Adli and my um, translation partners, uh, Simon Redcliffe and also end user partner, Bruce Whittaker from Oz Minerals. Thank you. And if you have any questions, uh, you're more than welcome in during the morning tea or lunch. Okay. We've actually got time for one or two questions oh, now okay. from the room. If anyone has any questions, Kirsten will bring the microphone over to you. And if you have any online questions, add them to the Zoom chat and we'll get to them during this discussion time. Any questions for you, Yeah. Thanks, Unias. Um Two questions. The first is, are you able to um, make a statement about how good a uh, job the automatic uh, process is relative to um, and Cathy will kill me for this but uh, a human logging and classifying uh, domains 
is the first one. And the second one is the limitations of this approach. Um, I'm assuming it's limited to the training set and uh, what's known. And if you come across a domain that you haven't previously encountered, how do you propose we handle that? Mm, yeah. yeah, I got the question. So in general, for the like a human visual inspection during the core logging process, uh, it seems that uh, whenever you have a different like a number of geologists, uh, they will uh, identify some of them quite differently based on their expert knowledge. And by this approach is purely data driven and it looks on the statistics. So assume that the uh, lab like lab work was done correctly and uh, everything is correct, uh, the produced results should be accurate based on the feeding data. But most of the time it has inherent problem because as you see that uh, the final categorical variable was predicted by human. So you assume that there is some noise. So, and also um, by introducing several, like uh, 20 variables, uh, this can be solved because it's easier when you see the like a quantity per each grade and make your prediction, which is hard just to analyze visually. So it's somehow aid to the core logging. And during my discussion with Bruce, it seems it, we come up with same results, but he did he did spend some time on that. I mean, uh, not exactly him, other geologists. But in our case, it's like fully automated. Just you need to be careful with your hyperparameters and feeding data. So that's why the pre-processing is really good technique to like solve that problem. And um, for another question, uh, what, what was the? <laughs> Ah, so actually it's re really a good question. Uh, this is problem of the classifier. So none of the least, like any um, machine learning method purely depends on the feeding data. So if you set up any other like unknown class there, it can uh, predict that one. But it depends how you uh, balance the overall feeding data. If it's imbalanced, it's a bit tricky. Because the like um, in the method itself, the picking up the ranges for particular prediction, uh, it might be biased. So that's why it's really important how you uh, process your data and how you handle imbalanced uh, situations. Yeah. Yeah. So we just have one more question, I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Yoni, yeah, it's great talk, mate. Uh, yeah. Tom Payton here. Just a quick question about the probability maps that you were showing for your model output, because uh, as anyone who's worked with machine learning knows that there's a big issue convincing people that a black box is giving them the right answer. And those probability maps look absolutely fantastic to me. Is that a commercial offering that you've just applied to your data set or is that something you developed yourself? No, it's uh, the probability is coming from two components. So the, the main one is coming from the geostatistical simulations scenarios. And another uh, probability is coming from the classifier itself. So if you think that the, your simulation is correct, the like uh, other probability will depends on the classifier. But the, essentially, those the like feeding data is coming from simulation. So is the main component for defining that uh, uncertainty or probability? Yes. Dr. Anita Newman is a postdoctoral researcher in the area of AI-based optimization in the Optimization Logistics Group at the School of Computer Science at the University of Adelaide, with 48 publications in top AI conferences and journals. Anita is a chair in the Real World Applications track at the Genetic and Evolutionary Computation Conference. Anita has won three research grants and has presented over 50 invited talks around the world. She received the ACM Women's Scholarship, which is sponsored by Google, Microsoft and Oracle. 
the Hans, Jürgen and Mariana Off Research Grant and Best Paper Nominations at the Genetic and Evolutionary Computation Conference in 2019, 2021 and 2022. Anita. Um, great. Thank you, uh, Ruth, very much for your kind introduction. Um, Yes, my, my name is uh, Aneta uh, Newman, and I'm working in the optimization and uh, logistic group here in the School of Computer Science at the University of Adelaide. And um, I would like to uh, give you um, a short overview about my research contribution and industry opportunities to the project Advanced um, Mine Optimization Under Uncertainty with MapTech uh, as a translation partner. The importance of facing, understanding, and predicting, and even mitigating uncertainty has been well acknowledged and studied in various fields such as engineering, physics, and finance. Continuing um, urbanization, particularly in Asia, looks set to continue to drive uh, metal demand, uh, while global shifts towards electric vehicles and renewable energy will dictate metal consumption. So in this project, we want to optimize a strategic long-term plan based on geological estimation uncertainty in the mine scheduling process. Um, you can uh, ask yourself um, why the uncertainty modeling and quantification of uncertainty is important. Strategic mine planning is a critical uh, stage of a mining project that aims to capture the maximum economic potential of mineral resources. The decision taking in this stage largely determine the expected cash flow um, of the project. Um, so um, again, why, why do you, um, um, in, what are the industry challenges? Um, Long-term open pit um, mine planning is an important stage of the mining project that seeks to establish a best strategy to extracting mineral resources based on the assumption of several economics and geological and operational parameters. So this is important to develop uncertainty modeling formulation that take advantage um, of available priori geologic knowledge and at the same time account for uncertainty in geological scenarios. By considering the uncertainty in the conceptual um, geologic model, it is possible to develop a novel, a robust, and advanced optimization under uncertainty. So mining uh, companies um, and investors understand the weakness of using an average model and average copper and gold grade. The first and important step to improve the estimate of project value is to model the uncertainties. And more generally, we consider here geological uncertainty in open pit mine planning. And you can see here um, on the right side, although the blocks all they have the same size, the characteristic of each block um, differ. So the grade, um, density, rock type, and confidence are all unique to each block within the entry block model, which defines the block model uh, uncertainties. And here, the overall goal is to maximize the net present value during the life uh, time of the mine. And here, I would like to give you a short um, overview about these uh, key findings. So firstly, we presented and um, the calculation and visualization of uncertainty in MapTech and mine planning software evolution, which is commercial software. We determine uh, the effects of uncertainty during the resource model creation, and particularly we determine effects of the net profit and net present value over the mine lifetime. Secondly, we investigated the impact of staging in the mine planning algorithm on the uncertainty. This approach utilizes a new methods for calculating the grade of the O of interest um, in the block model between drill holes by using neuronal networks. Afterwards, we use optimization methods uh, based on artificial intelligence methods and evolutionary algorithm. So evolutionary algorithm uh, have successfully been applied to wide range of um, optimization engineering problems. 
So we model it um, as next, we model it, um, the uncertainty in the mining process, and we propose a novel and robust method to minimize the uncertainties. Here we use uh, also artificial intelligence technologies and machine learning methods based on um, constraint multi-objective optimization, the variance and the covariance calculation uh, of the material and the probability theory approaches. So this method allows you to quantify uncertainties in the process uh, and to maximize project uh, value. And here's a few more words uh, about the uh, key findings of the first project. So we, we presented um, the calculation and visualization in uncertainty in the software for the long-term and strategic life mine schedule. Um, you can see here in the in the bottom middle, this is like a screenshot of the MapTech software. Here we investigate the and visualize the diverse plotting technique in, in transition partner software, and we quantify the effects of uncertainty done in this resource model creation and investigated uncertainty in various indifferent uh, geological model and determine effects of this net profit and uh, net present value over the mine's life plan. So in a nutshell, we evaluated here and visualized the uncertainty in the open pit mine. Um, in this case, we integrate our methods uh, in evolution. This uh, is a um, strategic um, mine planning software with uncertainty model, which is commercial mine planning and optimization tool. Uh, to our next uh, key findings is here we investigate the impact of staging in the mine planning algorithm on uncertainty. So our goal here is to reduce the variance in the quality and quantity of the ore produced by the mine and uh, produce robust and NPV over the life uh, of the mine by taking into account different staging approaches, uh, how, uh, you can see in the middle of the slides. We explore here the uncertainty of mining schedules and compare here four different staging approaches and analyze the impact of different scenario on the uncertainties. So here you can see the variance between uh, 10 results. Um, based on these plots in the particular duration. And this allows us to inform you um, of where the periods with high uncertainty are, which can directly impact the project profit value. And in this case, you may to decide to ask for more drilling data and assay data to be produced. And you will be able to see the effects of additionally drilled data on the uncertainty models through the software. Our next key finding is modeling uncertainties in the mining process. So um, it's, um, one of the most challenging aspects of the ore mine optimization is this quantification of uncertainty. And here, um, for the first time, um, to our best knowledge, we propose a novel and robust method to minimize the uncertainties. So artificial intelligence technologies enabled by a multi-objective optimization, the variance and the covariance calculation of this material and probability theory approaches will target resource attributes to optimize upstream processing. And this method would allow you to quantify uncertainties in the mine process to maximize the value for um, the transition partner and end users. So here we investigate more predictable evolutionary mine planning by discounting profits based on uncertainty. And here I would like to show you um, a short overview um, over the current work. Um, we in investigate um, at the top, you can see um, special separate regions of the ore base um, on the data provided by our industry partner MapTech. And um, then you can see here two plots. Um, um, there are our experimental results for uh, net present value based on classic strategy over six periods. And uh, on the right side, you can see the results of the new approach, uh, uncertainty discounted strategy. With this new approach, we are able to guarantee the profits based on the uncertainty measures in terms of the variance of the solution. So you can see in particular in, in, in in period three and four, the differences are we are able to get higher NPV value and also guarantee the better um, profit for the, for the um, project. So these results show our 
that our new approach for dealing with uncertainty has the potential to be highly successful and effective mind planning and to reduce the uncertainty of solutions significantly. So in this translation project, we are able to transfer our research knowledge directly and effectively into industry partner software and to help to tackle the industry challenges. This is demonstrated through a commercial software evolution with our module uncertainties. This is commercial relevant and proven beneficial system and was developed by um, the end user, and in <laughs> in terms of, I think I can go back. It's, no, it's not going back, but just uh, I would like to go over to um, to uh, to say then um, in also in a research, in terms of our research contribution for this project, there are like over um, twenty publication research articles that are published and accepted uh, and keep international artificial intelligence conferences and journals. And uh, now I would like, again, <laughs> it's going back, uh, I would like to uh, thank you and acknowledge the support from the state government of South Australia through um, our Brief Mining Consortium. And I would like to thank you, the University um, in Adelaide, uh, Frank, and also um, transition partner MapTech, um, Simon, Will, and uh, Mike, that are here today in, in this audium. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions for Anita? Kirsten, I believe Kathy is about to ask a question. <laughs> I just want to make sure that Gavin and I don't uh, shadow anybody else's questions in here. You know, Thanks for eventually mentioning that the biggest uncertainty for geology, it's all around data density. You know, frankly, that said, I mean, some knowledge stuff, but data density is the most interesting part of it. The biggest thing from our perspective, or my perspective, is you could do a lot of simulations in, in the geological space, and that's becoming very common, but most of the mine planning software does not handle multiple, you know, multiple consims or whatever type of simulations we like to use. So for our uh, MIPS, our partner, our translation partners out here. That's a, that's one of the biggest hurdles that we have. But still, it's it's great that you've articulated the difference in NPV, which is good. But still, the most fundamental thing for the engineer that uncertainty is due to geological uncertainty, and the way you get rid of geological uncertainty is called data collection. So. I was going to jump on a big question, but you answered that about halfway through. But it's still a big challenge in the industry side is getting people to actually understand it's that uncertainty and the ability. So, sorry, back on the geological side, we could do 100 con sims. The engineers can only use three or four of them, you know, and, and so lucky. what? Pardon? If you're lucky. If you're lucky. <laughs> and, and it's a big deal, you know, for us. So the things that can come out from you guys is more of this stuff. How can we get uh, more acceptance in the mine planning software front on how to handle multiple simulations, like 100 of them, which is pretty standard. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. So Kathy's absolutely right. Um, getting mine planning tools to use this, but I think Kathy, there's another, and I'd be interested if you've thought about this. Your discounting of uh, of profit or NPV value uh, due to uncertainty, um, if you turn that around, actually creates the value of the lack of information. So if you're having to discount value because of uncertainty, what Cathy's saying is that uncertainty is primarily driven by lack of data. If Cathy wants to justify going and drilling an extra hole, have you thought about using your discounting of value to drive the value of that additional information? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this is interesting uh, part. Like uh, how how you saw on the f on the second um, project part, we 
in the software, we are able like, to, to play this game like, uh, in the partnership between geologist and, uh, and software developer. What you can see the uncertainties. And there's like, only an example uh, for 10 plots uh, for the visualization, but it's, like, uh, it's pretty much can be done for 100 and more. Uh, so if you see like, this, this uncertainty in, 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 in kind of, um, in kind of uh, period, so you can go back to and map this to uh, to um, to block uh, the block model to, to the O and make additionally um, additionally drilling. But the the third part, what we are currently are doing, and it's still um, like a few months to go on this project. Um, we are we are looking on, on some scenarios uh, if for for the mine companies if if they are uh, if they have my, like. A, a, uh, simultaneously, they have like two uh, op open pits uh, material. Yeah, you, you can also add some stockpile to this, and then we, we are looking more into uh, this variability between these blocks, and we compute this um, this covariance matrix between. So, and th this is like another scenario that we have looking, and th then we are will be able to uh, to. To, to schedule how the best is the best like schedule for uh, for this for this two um, mine um, uh, region uh, taking into uh, account this uncertainty where they are different in the block models of all this and yeah and we we, we discount this uh, on some pa parameters uh, so. We we are not. Uh, I think this is like interesting part to take. How we will be able with this new research go back and additionally enforce new new drillings. But for now, we would like to show um, how if we have these uncertainties and they are like like di different. How we is the best schedule to operate this mine so far. So I, I think this will be interesting next step to to um, to get this uh, this methodology and to um, yeah to ensure more uh, more drilling data. So the first step yeah. is to take one to visualize uncertainty so that could educate drilling programs like you're mentioning. But the second step is for for people who don't want to go out and do a lot more drilling, can we quantify by not doing more drilling how much money you could potentially lose? And in some of our our examples, that was in the order of you know three hundred million dollars. So it buys, a lot of it buys a lot of drilling. So yeah, that's a lot of Ferraris at the end of the day. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. There will be time for more questions during the discussion time for those people that had more questions. And I should also note to the online audience, enter your questions via the Q&A box, not via the chat. I have been giving you incorrect information. So Dr. Chi Zhao is a postdoctoral research fellow from the School of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Adelaide. She completed his PhD in 2016 at the School of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Adelaide and his thesis focused on 3D stockpile modelling and quality calculations for iron ore stockpiles at ports. She joined the consortium in 2019, has one journal publication and aims to submit a second paper to a high impact factor journal in mining science at the end of this year. Welcome, she. Thanks for the introduction. Just trying to make up the something I missed. So the personal achievement uh, for the last year, I got my six-year-old boy, who is the youngest uh, um, in year one in his class, achieved the satisfactory results. But also he brings some virus to our family as well. And uh, <laughs> uh, my second one, she was born last year, so she's one half years old and she started to talk, and so we demand us quite uh, frequently. So welcome to my presentation, and um, <clears throat> fast room stockpile modeling for blending optimization. Um, my project aims to generate near real-time 3D multi-layered room stockpile models for uh, optimization. So the circle highlights where my project sits in the supply chain. 
I summarized three main contributions from this project. First, we can create 3D stockpile models in near real time without introducing any extra hardware to the current stockyard management system. Second, we can calculate the quality and quality distributions within a stockpile uh, with high degree of accuracy, use such 3D model and quality assay results. And last, together with the research outcome from another brief project, I can build a demonstration system, and this demonstration system can minimize the reclaiming time and meets the required quantity and quality combinations precisely. Um, the all movement from the NP location, <coughs> the all movement from the NP location to the room stockyard, and from the room stockyard to the crusher is actually carefully monitored and recorded uh, at permanent hill. But a big challenger for the room stockyard management system is to calculate and trick the qualities of the arm during the handling operations. My geologists have to use outdated information in quality calculation and save the calculation results as weighted percentage. So during the handling, uh, during, during the handling operations, the imaging here showing the movement of a dump truck from the NP location to a dumping location at the room stockyard. Um, please be noticed, because of the reception issue, the GPS signal was biased when the truck was below the ground. And when the mine geologist is making decisions, it is very difficult to, them to, select a, to, to dump the material at a selective location because they do not know the quality of the stockpile. And uh, some of those decisions are made based on the rule of the sum. Um, so these operations, these operations could be result high cost, low efficient, and less effective operations. Um, our Earth has quickly become a digital world. We have many smart devices around our, around our, ourselves in daily life. So we have smartphones, we have smart TVs, and even a smart house. And one of the benefits of using such smart devices is they can help us making some good decisions without costing the arm and the leg. So using a smart house as an example, the energy saving system can control the lights and the temperature based on the sensor readings. Uh, conference publication indicate the potential energy saving for such smart house could be up to 20%. And the mining industry consumes a huge amount of energy, so there is a significant potential to reduce the energy consumption if we can have a smart room stockpile. At Permanent Hill, we have uh, a sensor system, and we also even use the drones to scan the stockpiles every half month for accurate modeling. And my colleague Harad, he has developed a group of optimization algorithms to optimize the material handling. The only thing we're missing here could be the stockpile models. And these models need to be updated or created continuously during the handling operations. This project offers a solution to the modeling process. My industry partner, ECA, has the technique to build 3D stockpile models in almost near real time. And uh, those 3D stockpile models may be separated by the layers. The quality of the material in each layer could be different. And uh, meanwhile, um, sorry. And meanwhile, when we calculate the quality of the stockpiles, we can based on the 3D geometric relationship between the stockpiles. So eventually the quality calculation result will be much accurate than what we have at the moment. Using the calculation results, we can send in our dump trucks to the different locations to optimize the quality of a room stockpile or, room stockpile, or even a group of stockpiles. We can even reclaim material from different locations proactively to achieve the required quality and the quality combinations precisely. And my demonstration system aims to optimize reclaiming operations. With respect to the stockpile modeling, 
I create a 3D stop clock model uh, from merging all the scanning data into one big file. And uh, the boundaries of this uh, 3D stockyard is highlighted on the right-hand side of the image. So the, uh, these boundaries will be used to align the, the base layer of this stockyard uh, when the new scanning data become available. And uh, I also extract the dumping locations, the headings of the truck, and also the, the tontages from the my jigsaw my op uh, backup files. So the image on the right shows the perfect cone-shaped stop house created by, based on information extracted. And I would like to mention that uh, ICA has better technique to build more realistic stop house models than what I have demonstrated here. And uh, I also extract the quality information from the sampling result and mapping this uh, quality information to the H truck load. So when calculates the quality and the quality distributions, we calculate the volume of the stop pile and the volume of the layers inside the stop pile separately. This will bring a more accurate quality calcula calculation results. And to update the stop pile model during during the reclaiming operations, I create a kinematics model of the front wheel loader or front end loaders. Um, the moving paths of the bucket can be, oh, sorry. This kinematics model can simulate or can represent different reclaiming patterns of the bucket. The one I'm using is called the simultaneously lifting and uh, pushing and lifting operations, which means the bucket will be pushing to the stop pile and then lift up simultaneously at the same time. So the carting surface created by this kilometrics model is considering as the, oh sorry, the moving parts of the bucket can be considered as the carting surface uh, created by the bucket. So use the 3D intersection, I can actually separate these cartings into workflows. Um, so the image on the bottom right shows the carting surface created by the kinematics model, and the image at the bottom right shows the voxels created by these three carting surfaces. And when we calculate the quality, or uh, when we calculate the volume of the voxels, I can create an alpha shape, and uh, the volume can be calculated based on the alpha shape. And this volume calculation while considering the intersection between the stockpiles, the multiple layers inside the stockpiles, or even the material from different stockpiles. The last step will be update the stockpile models after the reclamation. So um, this process is very similar to the voxelization. The only thing, uh, the only extra is I create those two side vertical surfaces for display purpose only. Uh, my Herat colleague has created a group of uh, optimization algorithms in his uh, PhD study, and I'm very, he is one of the presenters today, so I'm very certain he will just introduce more details about his research. But uh, what I'm trying to say here is, um, he packed all the optimization algorithms into one box. Basically, if I can provide the correct input, now he the black box can output the optimal solutions for us. The data set used for his research is also provided by ICA, but uh, it is not from a real room stockyard. So I'm trying to use the information I extracted previously to create a real scaled room stockyard, but with less stockpiles to provide an optimization system to track the movement of the all and calculate the quality precisely and also minimize the reclaiming time. I would like to take this opportunity to say thank you to my supervisors, my end use partners, and my translation partners. Yeah, that's the end of my presentation. <laughs> Do we have any questions? <laughs> oh, we have one from Simon. 
Thanks, Simon Ratcliffe from MapTech. Thanks for the presentation. I've got a question regarding um, when when dumping events from trucks mm -hmm. don't match the location that is revealed in laser scans because of GPS inaccuracies or th these sorts of things. You uh, are, uh, have you worked on techniques to reconcile those those errors? Yes. Okay. Um, the idea is like uh, at Permanent Hill, the stop house will be scanned every half monthly using the dome. So eventually, I believe they can provide more accurate uh, modeling results. So by aligning the base layer of the, the, stop the stockyard model together, so all the stop house on top of the, the base layer will be reconciled. That's what we are thinking at the moment. Dr. Yu Xi completed her PhD with the consortium in August 2021 and is now working as a postdoctoral research fellow at the School of Computer Science at the University of Adelaide. Yu produced five papers during her PhD and presented the outcomes at several top international conferences with another presentation scheduled for later this year. During the PRIF lifetime, Yu got a cat and since completing her PhD, has had a lot more time for her yoga. Welcome. Thank you. So, the red button. Hi, thank you very much. But just clarify, I didn't get a cat. I get a car. <laughs> yes. And yeah, that's a huge difference. But have a card is my is my dream, but haven't be a realist. Oh. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Yue Xie from the University of Adelaide, and I obtained my PhD degree last year. So I haven't met most of these meeting rooms people for almost a year. So hi guys. <laughs> So my project is the blending strategy optimizations, which aim to model and optimize stockpile blending. And this project is under the material handling, huge title. And these three key findings of my project. First, we developed the first mathematical model that optimized the blending strategy. And then we apply this model to a large scale and a long-term schedule and found that the out and find that our algorithms outperforms the original approach. Then, for further research, we apply the model to the random environment to improve the model. And why these findings are important? First of all, the stockpile blending is an important component in mining engineering, and as reducing vari variations in stockpiles can save hundreds of millions of dollars. And considering these stockpile blending problems in a large scale is more realistic that was and uh, what is currently done, sorry. And the uncertainty in the geological input data can affect the optimization result. Here is the, I will just generally introduce what is the whole situations of this project. So these pictures shows the upstreams in the mining engineering, the oral are mine from the open pit mine or underground mine and the shipping to shipping and the store in the stockpiles. Then we claim and the blending material from different stockpiles to generate each bench. And those bench are sending to the downstreams, <coughs> sorry, which is the mill factory. And after some chemical processings, we obtain the final productions, which should match the marked plans and also the customer requirement. And our, in our project, we concentrate on how to generate this bench. And there are three main source of constraints for generating such a bench. So first is coming from the mine plan because it limited the resource, 
how many tonnage are available in each stockpiles, and the quality of those stockpiles. And the second is coming from the mill part, because in the sack mills, there are some limits of the characteristic of each bench. And the last source of constraints is coming from the market plans. It, the customer requirement is different in is different in time to times. So it limited the tonnage in the final productions. So what we did, in the beginning when I start with my project, I receive such a spell sheet from OZ Mineral. Yeah, so what we did, so we identified the numbers in each sales and trying to find the relationship between them and generate a mathematical model. And after we have these mathematical models, we translate in it into computer language. And here I use Java. Then, so the last page is of our key, first key findings. And so for to make this project more realistic, and both in both scales and time free, we consider the problem in large scale and plan the batch for up to one year. Now we're facing the challenge of such a uh, target, which is the complex constraints, because we have three main source of constraints and the large scales of both stockpiles and the benches. Because we make a plan for up to one year. For one year, it contains 12 months, and for each month, it asks for three to five uh, benches. So what we did, we first introduced some operators for taking the complex constraints. And then we introduce an algorithm for the long-term problems. And uh, to improve the performance of our algorithms, we introduce uh, some other operators to improve that. And then we're trying to involve the uncertainty in our project. So we consider the problems in a random environment. In these issues, we're still facing the challenges coming from the complex constraints and the uncertainty in the geolog geological input data. So what we did, so we first assumed the material grade from uh, in the stock pile. Oh, sorry. Uh, I didn't touch any. Yeah. <laughs> Did I start to press? Oh, no, before. The above one. Hello, no. Oh, yeah, this one. Thank you very much. Yeah. So what we, uh, yeah. And then we apply the chance constraints optimizations to reformulate some constraints to the chance constraints. And based on this model, we solve the whole project. And for the future works, because currently we're only considering the stockpile blending problems, and as introduced in the second page of the presentations, there is a whole supply chain in the mining engineering. So what we can do, first, we, also, we always can improve the performance of our algorithms, and then we can connect our project to any other projects under the material handling projects, such as the research project six, uh, translate project four or five. And in the end, we can consider in the stockpile in the whole supply chain of mining. And that's a big picture, okay. And in the end, I want to thank to my principal supervisor, Professor Frank Newman for giving me this chance to take a PhD in in the University of Allied and join this brief council team. And my co-supervisor, Dr. Antina Newman, always support me for the research. And our end user partner, the Miss Natalie from the OZ Mineral for giving us all the background we need for the data, for the data they provide. And all the PhD students and postdoctor in the brief. And thank you very much. Cheers, very interesting stuff. 
Um, Luke Balzan from Scantech. Uh, I'm just wondering whether uh, in the research uh, and as part of uh, the work that you were doing, um, had you considered using any uh, feedback data uh, from downstream to influence uh, how you were uh, kind of controlling or, or updating any of the blending models or anything like that? Actually, we don't have those informations from the end users. But if we could have, then of course we can improve our algorithm without only considering the constraints. And we, we, and we the, uh, I guess the feedback for you is from the sec mills or the mill part, right? Because there are so many constraints from them. They, and uh, there are some, the fluorine recovery rate constraints, the uranium recovery rate constraints, but we only have the number for the lower bound of them. But if we can have keeping update, then our algorithm can be uh, on time optimization algorithms. But that's ideally ideal. Yeah, sure. Sounds really interesting. Yeah. One more question. <laughs> I like to I, I like this and in a lot of places they actually have the benefit or maybe it's not a benefit of having multiple stockpiles on the surface and blend from an Olympic dams case we try to avoid those you know so all the materials we mine from 25 active places underground at any one time and deliver that directly to the ROM pads you know things that are going directly into the mills so how could you see, you know, your kind of work that you've been doing on having multiple stockpiles on the surface, what about going back to the source where you might be extracting from a whole variety of sources on any one day or over any one period of time? Do you see any potential applications for that? Oh, so you mean in Olympic dams, all the resources are coming directly from mine to mill. Mm -hmm. Then we can have simulation data from different parts. Sorry, I don't have much background in mining. So that I image from different part located in the mine body, they have different grade materials. Then we can put different part in the mine as different stockpiles. Then we can claim, but then that's related to the mine plan. I guess they have also penalty or constraints for the mine plan, but we can combine them and then make it as a long term. Scheduling. Yeah, so maybe the purpose of, of my comment is that scenario that you've been working on is fantastic, but I think it's a real, it's it's relatively straightforward, yeah. but there's far more complexities than that in the background. And so, do you see potential for the future for increasing to uh, increasing your your capability to to deal with more complex maybe blending situations and blending that occurs further back from directly in front of the mills, you know, in surface stockpiles. Thank you. Yeah. That's interesting. Thank you, you, and I'm sorry you didn't get a cat. That's really disappointing. <laughs> we'll now have a bit of a break for morning tea in the foyer, and please use that time to have a look at the posters that are on display with the PRIF work. I do note we're about 20 minutes behind time. But we will still have 20 minutes for morning tea, and we'll try and make up some time after morning tea and during the lunch break. Thank you.